The account of the 1897 airship is a story of a UFO sighting, an alien encounter, a cattle mutilation, and ultimately a crash retrieval. It is also very much a story of its time, with steampunk architecture, old-school flight technology, and strange blue men. Let's explore. Hi everyone, and welcome to Project Blue Book, where we explore all things unidentified. I am Thor, and thanks for tuning in. Between November of 1896 and April of 1897, an anomalous airship was sighted, first in the vicinity of San Francisco's East Bay, and later around Sacramento, California, and was seen by hundreds of people as it traveled against the wind using searchlights beaming to the ground before heading north, it seemed, towards Mount Shasta, today a recognized hotbed of UFO sightings. The airship was next reported in Tacoma, Washington, and across the Canadian border, before moving east through Idaho and Kansas, all the way to Wisconsin and Chicago, ultimately culminating in multiple sightings in Texas in the spring of 1897. The description of the airship vary wildly, but in context of 1897, they all had a flavor of what we would today call steampunk aesthetic, made famous in movies like Wild Wild West, in essence, taking late 19th century technology like steam engines, railroads, and steamboats, and just adding wings to them and exterior technology that is undefined, propellers and some hot air balloon technology, and you have yourself the airship the people saw in 1896 and 7. Fanciful and not real, right? That's the version of the debunkers, because it's how 400 newspapers across the country depicted the airship sightings in their illustrations. What other reference would they have? They also shared visual features and descriptions known from Jules Verne novels, as well as Frank Reed Jr. fantasy series. Basically, an ocean ship with helicopter and airplane propellers and balloon add-ons to make them airworthy. Jacques Vallée has looked into UFO encounters through the ages and how experiencers describe them based on culture and time and has come up with the theory that UFO sightings are always described through the lens of contemporary experiences, reality, and imagination of its time, influencing people's description of what they witness, and that this must be taken into account, even today. It all culminated in Aurora, Texas. On April 19th, S.C. Hayden, a correspondent for the news, reported that an airship had struck a windmill in Aurora and exploded. The body of a small man identified by local authorities as a Martian, was recovered from the wreckage and immediately buried in the Aurora Cemetery. There were dozens of eyewitnesses in multiple counties. One of the most famous eyewitness accounts is that of John Barclay, who was awoken late one evening by the barking of his dogs. He noticed a high-pitched whirring sound outside. He took his gun and went outside to investigate and to his disbelief, descending to the ground a few hundred yards away was a large metallic cigar-shaped object over 500 feet in length. Huge. Described as the most credible person to ask for as eyewitness, Barclay stated he walked towards it and noticed lights inside, brighter than any electric lights he had seen. As he approached, a person appeared in front of him out of nowhere, and he asked him for his name, where he was from, and where he was going. The person to Barclay, a very peculiar-looking one, not quite like normal people, he said, responded in perfect English, to never mind his name, call me Smith, and I'm from anywhere. I'll be in Greece tomorrow. The visitor asked him for lubrication oil, two chisels, and a bluestone, and handed him a $10 bill. Barclay asked to see the ship on the inside, but they would visit him another time to invite him on board. Barclay walked away and soon returned with the lubricating oil and two chisels. 
The visitor told him to keep the chains, and the craft took off and disappeared. Another eyewitness, who also exchanged words with inhabitants of the airship, described seeing symbols written on the side of the craft they could not decipher. Others insisted these inhabitants were not of this world, and of course, someone said they looked like the embodiment of the devil. Then there were others that believed these were in fact human-made airships on a test flight. The crew on occasion even told eyewitnesses as much, and people believed some inventor or industrialist would soon come forward and claim ownership, but they never did. Thomas Edison even had to make a statement. It was not his. For context, let's remember this was April of 1897. The first rigid frame airship designed by David Schwartz took flight only a few months later on November 3rd, 1897. And the Wright brothers' test flyer flew successfully on December 17th, 1903, six and a half years later. Hot air balloons were known already. They've been in existence since 1783. So how do we decipher the sightings of a starship in 1896 and 97? To be truthful at all, and that whole account was not just a flight of fancy, literally. Thankfully, many have researched this incident, gathered testimony, descriptions, and even collected artifacts, and written books about it, including Jim Morris with his book Aurora, the UFO Crash of 1897. About a year ago, when I got hold of the entire front page of the April 19, 1897 edition of the Dallas Morning News, there are 16 stories on that front page. And they all, back then, you didn't have big newspaper staffs. In fact, newspapers were generally run by the town printer. And what you had was correspondence. And you had people who volunteered to uh, keep the newspaper apprised of what was going on, and they would send letters about what was happening in the community. Well, on this, uh, on this particular edition of the Dallas Morning News, 16 stories on the front page, and every single one of them concerned the silver cigar-shaped object flying through the skies of North Texas. You can see the headline up here at the upper left, the great aerial wanderer, okay? And uh, that one, I think this is a smoking gun. In 1973, Jim Mars interviewed senior citizens in Aurora and vicinity, farmers, judges, and others who remember hearing about it at the time, in their childhood or early teens. And then there is Charlie Stevens, who remembers doing chores with his dad on the farm that day when this thing flew overhead, cylinder-shaped, shining metallic like silver, floating silently in the air towards town. It disappeared behind a hill, and then he heard an explosion, and that's when they saw the smoke. Charlie wanted to run and see what was going on, but his dad, a practical man, said they first needed to finish their work of the day. The next day, April 18th, his father went to town and came back with stories, claiming the airship crashed into a windmill on Judge Proctor's property and exploded, the debris raining over his front property and ruining his water well. While Charlie Stevens' father made no mention of an alleged victim of the crash, the craft's pilot, stories abound about the small man that was found on Judd Proctor's grounds, deceased. He was small, in uniform, and looked to be not of this earth, several newspapers reported, including the Dallas Morning News of April 19th, almost matter-of-factly. The pilot was buried in the Aurora Cemetery in an unmarked grave, having a peculiar tombstone, half of which has been gone for decades. And as to the water well on Judge Proctor's property, Jim Mars also interviewed Brawley Oates in 1973, who bought the property from Judge Proctor, who owned it at the time of the crash. All of this is traceable, and he said to Mars, he and his wife pulled a number of metal pieces out of the well when they bought it. They thought they could rebuild it, but everything around it felt dead and poisonous, like it was radiated, said Brawley Oates in 1973. And he wasn't just saying this. He and his wife have had health issues their entire lives, with strange deformities inflicting their arms, in particular their hands, those hands that dove into the well, to pick up the debris and haul it away. They had no health issues before, only after. They ultimately concreted the well, up for good. 
He did show a small piece of metal to Jim Morris, stating it came from the well. Jim took it and had it analyzed by Dr. Tom Gray, a physicist at the University of North Texas. Upon examining the piece, he said as follows, quote, I don't mean by my comments to indicate whether this is of terrestrial or extraterrestrial origin, but the physics of that much iron without magnetism stirs my curiosity as a scientist, end quote. In other words, the piece he had examined was 75% pure iron, 24% zinc, and 1% trace material, a combination that should present a significant amount of magnetism, but it didn't. Really, there's no question in my mind that, that whether or not the crash in Aurora took place, and I'm pretty convinced it did, there was something flying through the air of North Texas in 1897, and this is six years before the Wright brothers ever flew. And immediately I've had people say, yeah, well, maybe it was a test dirigible. The first dirigible flight in the United States was the California era, which lifted off from Anaheim, California. And that was in the same year, 1903. So all, all my time of studying UFOs, I've always thought, wouldn't it be great if we had a well-documented case um, where there were no satellites, there were no commercial aircraft, there were no heavier-than-air flight. Well, this is it, folks. And I consider this the smoking gun of the UFO issue because here is a well-documented instance of something flying around through the air at very slow speeds, landing, communicating with people, going at very fast speeds at a time when there was nothing man-made in the air. Consider this. In 1942, following the UFO sighting, aerial raid and crash over Los Angeles, five years before Roswell, the then wartime chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General George C. Marshall, in response to the sightings, Marshall sent out a memo that he wanted all accounts, testimony and data of unknown aircraft sightings from 1942 dating all the way back to 1897, and I say not a coincidence. But if you went to Aurora, Texas today, to the cemetery, and dug up that mysterious grave, chances are you'll find nothing at all anymore. You can watch and listen to this and other podcasts on Project Blue Book where we explore all things unidentified. Each day, let's practice compassion and kindness. And please subscribe. I am Thor, and thanks for tuning in. See you next time.